Welcome all and thank you for joining us today at another AWRI webinar. I hope you're enjoying these sessions as much as I am. Uh, my name is Robin Dixon. I'm a senior viticulturist uh, for the AWRI and I'm joining you today from Ghana country and in the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So in this session, uh, we, we will be getting an update on Sustainable Wine Growing Australia. So while we give a few people uh, a chance to, to jump on to the webinar, I have a couple of quick reminders for anyone who's new to AWRI webinars. And if you are new, welcome. Um, we'd like, if you'd like to um, provide a, a comment or ask a question, please click on the Q&A button. It's at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar. So type in your question and click send and send it through. Uh, we'll be holding the Q&A session at the, uh, at the end of the presentations, but feel free to send your questions through at any time. Uh, also a reminder that uh, this session is being recorded and a, a link uh, to the recording uh, that's uh, saved on our YouTube channel will be emailed to you. So for anyone who's just joined, welcome today's top. Today we'll be um, receiving an update on sustainable wine, grow wine growing Australia. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Anna Hooper from Australian Grape and Wine, Drea Hall from Wine Australia, and Dr. Marty Longbottom from the AWRI to the webinar today. So first up, I'd like to introduce Anna Hooper. So Anna joined the National Peak Body for the Wine Sector, Australian Grape and Wine, after a long career <coughs> me, as a grower and producer of wine in Australia and overseas. Her enduring interest in sustainability has seen her receive several awards, including the South Australian Rural Woman, Women's Award in, in 2013, sorry, uh, which provided the opportunity to research the drivers of leadership in, sus in sustainability amongst wine producers. She has been a director on a number of private and government boards relating to wine and natural resource management, including Australian Vignerons, where she later became CEO, and are now advocates for continual improvement in both economic and environmental policy and assists the sector in strategies that improve resilience and preparedness for threats. Thank you, Anna. If you're ready, I'll hand over to you.
Thanks, Robin. Um, and also thanks to um, AWRI for inviting me to speak today. Um, I want to just start by saying how exciting it is to be part of Sustainable Wine Growing Australia at such a pivotal time for the program. Um, so I'm here on behalf of Australian Grape and Wine as co-owners um, as co-owners of the Sustainable Wine Growing Trust Mark. We're also um, the peak body representing grape growers and winemakers across Australia. So we work in leadership, social licence and political advocacy, funded primarily by grape growers and wine producers. As you're probably well aware, we recently consulted the grape and wine producers across Australia to develop a vision for the sector, which, uh, which contains some fairly bold sustainability targets, in which, and that this included to achieve a net zero um, emission status and net zero waste by 2050. So that vision is available on our website. Um, but we wrote this vision back in, 20, in April 2020, and already times have changed, and we now believe that our emissions targets are nowhere near ambitious enough. So having ambitions and having ambitions and goals is pointless without a pathway. So we're currently developing a roadmap for zero emissions for the sector. So today my focus is going to be on the social and political environment, both in Australia and abroad, as well as some of the emerging opportunities and risks. So when it comes to one of the most important issues, climate change, our own political leaders tend to be at odds with each other on this, with states and national commitments having been slow to converge. So all as you're probably aware, all Australian state and territory governments over the last five years have developed their own net zero emissions strategies for 2050, with um, many having met, also having medium term targets uh, to show that they're on, on that trajectory. And a federal net zero target has been deeply a deeply divisive, divisive proposal, even within the coalition. Um, recently elected leader nationals, uh, of the Nationals, Barnaby Joyce, has, um, is opposed to any net zero deadline. And I think uh, it's, it's quite likely that current, the current government will announce a net zero strategy in the coming months. It's likely that this will be announced prior to the UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties that will take place later this year in Glasgow. So it's also worth noting that the National Farmers Federation, who represent one of the nation's biggest emitters in agriculture, supports an economy-wide aspiration for net zero emissions. Now, this is interesting because I think the fact that they see more opportunities than costs in terms of um, net zero emissions really says something that would not be happy. And so we, um, we wouldn't see them saying this if they didn't see tremendous economic benefits in, in um, agriculture going green. So while there remains areas of uncertainty, one thing we do know, there's one thing that we do know for certain, and that's that the nature and pace of change towards a greener future is unprecedented. The future is likely to see more and more opportunities for grape and wine producers pursuing leadership in sustainability and less and less for those who don't. While there remains areas of uncertainty, one thing, um, sorry, abroad we've just said, for example, abroad we've just seen the EU's announcement of their intention to, Im to impose a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which would see a tariff on certain imports from countries not taking equivalent steps to deal with climate change. And this has really been a call to action. What does this mean? It means that sustainability it's no longer just about people who see themselves as philanthropists for the environment or looking to value, add their products or tell a nice story. This is about sustainability becoming a social license problem. And that now has a significant, uh, significantly broader set of stakeholders. So the one thing we're probably most familiar with in terms of stakeholders are the retailers. I'm not gonna dwell on that other, to, other than to say that many of the world's largest food and grocery chains now have public corporate social responsibility statements. For example, both Coles and Woolies have resp responsible sourcing programs. And it, although in the past, this has tended to focus on high risk products such as seafood, cocoa, coffee, and sugar, and high risk uh, activities such as waste emissions, animal welfare, and human health. I think as we get better at providing the public with information, their expectations continue to rise and with this, so will the pressure for robust performance reporting. On the international environment, Australia is a signatory to the Paris Agreement. This, require, this requires of its 200 odd signatories that they make commitments to emissions reduction 
And a handful of signatories have also publicly committed to net zero emissions, including EU, UK, Japan and South Korea. While the policy recommendations of the Australian government, financial regulators have not been quite so explicit to date, we do expect that we'd like to, we do expect that we will see Scott Morrison um, come out with an announcement in the coming months, and there's certainly um, been some rhetoric to that effect. And we also hear him being fairly uh, supportive of the idea of being able to get to net zero emissions if we can. So the carbon border adjustment mechanism, this is something the EU have recently announced and it's um, design, been designed to create a level, level playing field for EU producers who have to pay a carbon pricing with, uh, with, um, with their trading nations. It's designed to, so as to be compliant with, with World Trade Organization rules and um, other international obligations of the EU. Initially, we'd see the adjustment rolled out to emitters, um, such as iron and steel to high emitters, such as iron, steel, cement, fertilizer, and electricity. But should it be introduced, the plan would be that importers, and should it be introduced, the plan would be that importers can deduct any of their carbon costs incurred in their own hometown, such as Australia, from the certificates that they have to purchase in order to export. In this con in the context, to put that into some context, text, the current market price for ACCUs or carbon credit units in Australia has been around $16 per unit, or it's now just gone to over 20 on the spot market. But in EU, on the other hand, where they have much tougher policies, the price is 57 euros per tonne. So the price of Australian credits is predicted to rise fairly significantly if our climate policies are also toughened. A number of countries in the US have also shown interest in going down, including the US have shown interest in going down this path of a carbon border adjustment mechanism. And it's all, they, these um, similar mechanisms are already in place in certain areas such as California, where there's an adjustment for imports of electricity. The proposal would come into full force in over, be phased in over three years, um, and eventually potentially is likely to extend to other parts of the value, value chain, for instance, shipping, which um, would have an impact. So there's no suggestion yet that it would uh, apply to agriculture. However, if it was to apply to other parts of the supply chain, that would certainly impact upon the wine sector. Sustainable development goals. These are goals that were set up by the United Nations in 2015 for achievement by 2030. They're a collection of 17 interle interlinked goals designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. They serve as a call to action by all countries to protect the planet. And whilst the sustainable SDGs are targeted to countries, they also open up really important um, considerations for businesses, such as the potential to open or enhance markets, um, market access implications, uh, opportunities to enhance reputation linked to these and also just the ability to maintain a social license to operate in those supporting countries. So as such, we have reviewed Sustainable Wine Growing Australia and to, to ensure alignment with these goals. And finally on the EU, they've recently released a farm to fork strategy. Now this initiates some fairly serious changes relating to agricultural practices. For example, they recognise the use of chemical pesticides in agriculture contribute significantly to soil, water, air pollution and biodiversity loss, and they can harm non-target plants and other species, and as such have established a harmonised risk indicator and to quantify the progress towards reducing risks with pesticides. And this action is likely to reduce their overall use and risk of chemical pesticides by 50% over the next 10 years. At home in Australia, in terms of reducing, at home in Australia, in terms of reducing emissions, we've seen, uh, we've had a carbon market now for about 10 years and Australians, including farmers, can earn carbon credit units called ACCUs for every tonne of carbon dioxide, uh, dioxide equivalent that they store or avoid emitting. So these units can be sold to the Australian government through a carbon abatement contract or to other businesses seeking to offset their emissions. There are uh, several, no, there are num there have been, we've identified a number of barriers to adoption of carbon farming um, within the viticulture sector. And that's partly linked to the fact that these ACCUs are fairly low in value at the moment and also project compliance costs tend to um, blow uh, 
make it not cost effective because of measurement auditing and reporting, and also the requirement for permanence tends to deter a few people. In terms of waste, the federal government this year commissioned CSIRO to develop a circular economy roadmap. So with many countries are no longer taking our waste as they once did, it's, it's um, generated a need to phase out the exporting of waste materials. And this has sort of hastened our progress towards a circular economy. And there's plans and policies being developed to generate high value recycled, great recycled commodities and increase the demand for these. So this is gonna generate a need for greener manufacturing solutions that will be required um, and potentially of the sector as this sector of the wine sector. In Australia, the use of pesticides might not be such, um, such a key focus as it is in the EU. However, as we see trading nations change their in maximum residue levels, it certainly has far on impacts as to what we can do here. And we also have, at the moment, we're currently seeing a review into the AgVet regulatory system. And this is likely to lead to recommendations or has led to some draft rec recommendations that we see an increase in mandatory reporting for residues in products on the Australian market. I'm gonna talk a bit about biodiversity now, because this is something that uh, Agriculture Minister David Littleproud really would like to hang his hat on. They've committed um, in the last budget $32 million to expand their agriculture, agricultural stewardship package, which builds on a um, commi previous commitment of 34 million. Um, and what we're seeing this do is um, develop a overarching framework for sustainability. So it's the process started with stakeholder consultation and what they found is that complexity and cost of um, existing programs and also the fact that we've got multiple different environmental programs was serving as a barrier uh, to producers, but also the absence of any real rewards for sustainability um, was preventing widespread uptake of sustainability programs. So the, um, as part of the stewardship package, the aim is to couple environmental markets with certification systems to better reward people for their biodiversity and sustainability practices. So this is exciting for us. Um, so what this could potentially become is a formal payment that could be on top of for instance, carbon credit payments under the Climate Solutions Fund that could be traded with the business sector. And apparently there's already a big demand for this type of product and pilots are currently underway for measuring, reporting and verifying environmental outcomes in various regions around Australia. Um, in terms of an overarching framework, this would serve to verify the current and emergent, em, emerging programs rather than reinventing the wheel. So, at the moment, the Carbon Farming Institute's in the process of developing an Australian agriculture sustainability framework, which is the picture here on the screen. And this will guide, be a guiding standard or a meta standard for other agricultural sustainability programs, such as Sustainable Wine Growing Australia. It will help to build an Australian sustainability brand and benchmark the outcomes that we're deriving from natural capital um, systems, therefore, thereby promoting certification and more consistent targets across certification schemes. Um, they're working with agriculture related organisations, including ourselves and RDCs, Wine Australia, and industry and private um, not for profit companies to incorporate uh, existing standards and schemes under a, a harmonised, this harmonised um, standard, which will be based on environmental, social government governance framework. So we've been um, close, along with the AWRI, have been closely involved in that. So in terms of the market opportunities in Australia around sustainability, they've also commissioned KPMG to develop a report called A Return on Nature, an ecosystem service market, services market. This is more of a deep dive into the extent of mainstream and emerging market opportunities to guide how sta this, a standard could better align itself to impact on decisions that, and to impact on decisions to buy or invest in sustainable products. And this could be consumers at the supermarket shelf, financiers or other parts of the value chain. So positive outcomes for farmers identified a range, um, there's positive outcomes for farmers that were identified as part of that such as reduced premiums, increased market access and more favourable interest rates. 
Uh, this report suggests that governments, businesses and investors and consumers are ready to support such a investment in such a structured ecosystem based fund that would support farmers to continue to improve natural capital on their properties. Um, so essentially, it creates a sustainability based financial instrument which will turn biodiversity and sustainable sustainability into a valuable and tradable commodity, a valuable and tradable commodity. The report suggests that government contributes to mark the market design, but the ongoing investment doesn't necessarily need to come from government, but fund managers, food companies, banks or other businesses connected either directly up to individual farm business or, or to farming groups and industries. So in 2011, the total value of ecosystem services was estimated to be US 125 trillion. Um, so it's fairly significant. So just a little bit more on sustainable finance. We're seeing more and more opportunities in terms of impact investment, which is where investors, investors are seeking to allocate capital towards generating positive, measurable social and environmental outcomes alongside just, uh, so not just financial returns. We're also already seeing intensified interest from investors with regards to reducing carbon emissions, for example, superannuation firms, some have identified a net zero 2050 position for their investment portfolio, which will flow through to investments, including banks and publicly traded agricultural businesses. Banks such as Rabo and ANZ have identified the need to quantify their emissions profile, their client base, which means that they're um, looking to see clients' profiles trending downwards. And the Commonwealth Bank has recently released a sustainability linked loan. And what this does is offers reductions in um, offer savings on interest rates based on companies that can demonstrate their performance, but also the flip side of that is penalties if they if they fail to. So what does the future hold? I think it's inevitable that we'll see more scrutiny on businesses from a, from a broader range of stakeholders. Sustainable agriculture, biodiversity, natural capital and ecosystem services will potentially operate, open up opportunities to generate income. We'll see sustainable finance instruments, impact investments such as green bonds and sustainability linked loans, increased costs from carbon emissions and increased opportunities for reducing, eliminating or sequestering carbon. So even when we start to see these incentives, I also expect we'll see related opportunities for the sector for improving performance and that in turn will generate opportunities such as greater incentives for soil improvement such as through and, and the establishment of cover crops, trees or native plants, and potentially co-benefits of tradable credits or other market-based instruments relating to biodiversity. Waste will have a value and we'll see biomass from waste used in products such as bioplastics, electricity generation and soil improvement. And we'll also see uptake of more plant and pest and disease, climate resilient crops and um, we're Currently, you have some grapevines bred for disease resistance at the moment and have already seen them registered for use in Europe. Low and zero emissions farm vehicles are likely to become more common and eventually uh, the ability to potentially the ability to cost effectively capture carbon from fermentation. So with such commitments by government departments, the opportunities in this space will continue to grow and we commit to ensuring that the wine sector is very well placed to capitalise on these opportunities as they arise. So I just want to conclude by saying that maintaining the status quo will not allow for business as usual. Driving serious improvements will become more and more critical in order to remain competitive in many of our important trading nations where political leaders are adopting greener policies at a hastening rate. Achieving this will be critical to remaining competitive in our key markets. Political leaders in the UK and the European Union and the United States have all indicated various intentions to make much more aggressive, aggressive action against their trading, the trading nations who trail behind. So the outlook and opportunities for producers looking to lead the charge in this area is very promising. However, failure to act early will result in increasing costs trade barriers, a potential loss of community support for the sector, and more cri critically, irreversible damage to the planet. 
We're very lucky compared to other sectors that we already have a, an advanced world-class program in place to assist us to do this, which we'll hear a little more about now. Being able to confidently and transparently measure and report against globally, globally recognised sustainability priorities through programs such as Sustainable Wine Growing Australia, which provide us confidence to tell our story, will be more and more critical. So I encourage everyone to get on board if they haven't already. The time is now. And for those who haven't watched enough Netflix over the last 18 months, I just want to conclude by bringing to your attention this um, David Attenborough episode um, called La um, episode called Life on the Planet. For anyone who hasn't, who hasn't seen it, I, um, I highly recommend you do. And there's a quote there from David Attenborough. I wanted to bring this up because I think it's it's when high profile people such as Sir David Attenborough put forward a call to action, society tend to, to respond. So watch this space. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Anna, for your presentation. I'd now like to introduce Drea Hall. So Drea joined Wine Australia in July 2018 and is now the Global Marketing Manager for Brands. She is responsible for brand strategy and storytelling communications for the wine sector's category brand Australia One Made Our Way. Since September 2020, Drea has also been the marketing lead for Sustainable Wine Growing Australia. She is passionate about promoting stories from the Australian wine community to consumers and trade around the globe. Drea has more than 20 years experience in marketing communications and advertising, specialising in category brand brands and content across wine, financial services and media publishing industries. If you're ready, Drea, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Robin. And thank you um, to the AWRI, AWRI for having us here today. And I do echo Anna's earlier comments um, that it's really an exciting time to be part of the sustainable Wine Growing Australia program and working together with the AWRI and Australian Grape and Wine to really help drive the um, program forward. And I say that on behalf of all of the team at Wine Australia. So today I'm just gonna take you through a little bit about um, what we've been doing all year, um, how you can get involved if you're not already, and also what we will be doing over the next year to drive the program forward. Hmm. Just bear with me. I don't know if my slide doesn't want to move forward. Here we go. Great. Okay. So I thought I'd just start with sharing a bit about the Wine Australia um, marketing strategy and also how, um, how the program fits overall and how uh, it is a, a, you know, a global strategy to take sustainable wine growing Australia to the world and help raise Australia's sustainability credentials. Um, but starting with our strate strategic pillars for Australian wine and, and branding, Australian Wine Made Our Way is very much the platform of what we go to market with globally, um, both from a trade and consumer point of view. Australian Wine Discovered sits within that um, ecosystem and that's our free access educational materials that um, all educators from around the globe or SOMS can implement and, and learn and educate others in the industry about Australian wine. Connect is the platform um, that we've launched just a few months ago, which is the business to business platform for how we're keeping the Australian wine community connected with the global trade in a world where we just can't travel um, the way we used to and for the foreseeable future. And that's having some great success. We just launched that three months ago. Um, and Sustainable Wine Growing Australia is very much um, where the focus has been to to create a, a new identity and a, a, a new narrative for the program. And um, yeah, and that's what I'm here to take you through today. So, sorry, I've got a bit of a touchy. I thought I'd also just set the scene with where, um, uh, I think Anna did a great job of saying what the global policy drivers are at the moment and, and they're coming thick and fast and there's a lot of change going on, but also 
what's happening from a consumer behaviour point of view from a global, um, uh, yeah, a global point. Um, and I think, you know, in 2019, and there were lots of um, climate, climate crises and consciousness, whether that's bushfires, wildfires, floods, et cetera, there was a real movement from um, consumers or, or just the, the consciousness of, of the con I call it the conscious consumer around the, the change in the environment. And due to this, um, and then the global pandemic, we've seen a lot of change. And the stats on the page here sort of illustrate really where, um, and these are all 2021 or December 2020 stats of where consumers are at um, in the different key markets around the world. And I will say that the Asian consumer um, study was one uh, from nine countries, which doesn't include China or Hong Kong. So we can see that um, at the forefront here is really um, environmental, you know, environmental consciousness and the change there is really what's driving um, forward how consumers are now change, um, considering and consciously purchasing products across all categories. So what's the priority right here and now for, um, for the program? And it's really to attract and retain, um, retain members uh, domestically. So we've started with a, a pretty good base, but we've got a lot more to go. And if we do want to be one of Australia's sustain, um, or sorry, a leading sustainability um, country in the world, we really need to get the nation um, supporting it, being participating in it, and actively um, actively participating in it. I think across Australia, we have a lot of um, producers and great growers that are acting sustainably, but this program is really about giving you the framework and helping you, giving you the tools to measure and monitor what you do. So the brief of what we've, we've really changed in the last nine months or so is around creating a new narrative, creating some tools, creating a standalone digital presence for the program, and we're going to more actively be engaging with regions across the, um, across the country. So here's, if you haven't seen um, the new um, standalone website or the new identity, it is um, with only three months ago transferred to this new uh, look and feel, if you like. So it does have a standalone um, identity and we are, um, yeah, we're really taking the program forward. We have a new narrative which will really focus around business, how you can, um, how we support your business or what the changes are in your business that you will see benefits from, um, whether they be financial benefits, cost savings, strengthening your brand story, strengthening value in your brand, um, and making sure that, you know, making it clear that sustainability is about a holistic approach to your business. It isn't about just what's going on in the vineyard or the winery. It's about looking at the business from an economic and also a social people and business point of view. It's about being part of the community and however you see that community, whether that's your local, your regional, your state, being part of the sustainable wine growing community or the global sustainable wine growing community. It is about the collective effort. And then, of course, for first and foremost, it's about your footprint and how you're measuring that with the environment. In terms of the strategic plan for a marketing focus for the um, year ahead, there's a, there's a lot to do, but um, we will, you know, we will get there. Um, so membership is first and foremost. But what we need to also do to help um, to help everybody across the nation is more regional engagement and giving all the regions the right tools, the right assets, that they can also help to spread the message within their regions and also for the state associations as well. So we look forward to uh, working with you on, on getting you the right tools and assets for what you need to um, make sure they're right for your region and dri help drive the right messages. We're also finding out about more in terms of the global supply chain. So something I probably should have touched on before with the consumer piece is that obviously consumers drive what retailers put on shelves and what that space is. And their criteria is changing and evolving pretty much by the day. And that's happening here with Coles and Woolies. It's happening globally. Tesco's, Waitrose, Sainsbury's. They're all 
making very defined criteria. And they're also auditing sustainable wine growing programs or any that say that they are. So this is all driving why it's time to consider or reconsider joining the program um, and participating because things are changing in a global sense around product consideration. And then really important is to make sure that um, through policy and all, all of the other changes that all these um, all bodies, um, all media are aware of Australia's sustainability credentials because as, the, as a collective, we can be stronger together. And I just wanted to touch on a little bit of the new narrative that, um, that has been developed. And a lot of this has all come from the research and the background of, of messages and um, that of just of research across the sector and industry. Those have been a lot of consultation that's occurred over the last few years. And this, the, these messages is really a result of that um, consultation. So it is about what the program stands for is around having a like-minded like um, community of growers and makers wanting to be make a positive difference. And that's pretty higher order. So what does that actually mean for you? It is about providing you a pathway to sustainability excellence. It is about giving you the right framework to help make it easier for you to measure and monitor and reduce and repeat. We do have a mission and that is to make our entire Australian wine community, community more sustainable. It is about giving people better products and keeping a thriving and resilient um, future for our industry here in Australia. And our vision is to be among the global best. We know that we've got the right framework. We know that we've got a very rigorous, if not, yeah, like one of the highest standards in the world. We now just have to get more people involved and also take that story to the world. And I've touched on it a bit. If anyone's hearing the key message around community, it is about working together as a community. And it has, uh, I think it's also an exciting time, as I've said, um, Australian Grape and Wine, the AWRI, AWRI and Wine Australia have come together as the lead organisations in wine to work together to help the rest of the Australian wine community come on board and join the program. The time is now. We've helped to um, break down the program. Uh, you'll find this on the new website about what you will be measured on within the workbook. And again, just back on the, what is it about? What do you do? It is about measuring what you do, monitoring that, reducing that, and then step and repeat. The advantages of that is that you do get to benchmark against, or well, look at how you've improved every year, but then also benchmark against your neighbours, those that live around you, those in the from a regional um, a regional perspective, and then also from a national perspective. But it's that continuous improvement of doing things that little bit better every year. We're also making it easier to join. So we've broken down the program. If you go to the website, sustainablewinegrowing.com.au, you will receive, you can sign up to a, a quick little email series, which over a series of about 10 days, you get stepped through what you need to do to prepare what you what um, those key measures are that you'll need to record and have that all to hand by the time you're ready to sign up and join the um, you know the workbook it, we know that it can take a little bit of time to take uh, complete that workbook it's not easy um, if you were to do it cold um, if you if you like but now we've got the resource and the tool to make sure that you can do, sit there and do it in a one go what are we doing as we look ahead? Um, look, over the next year, we really, yeah, it's really around that regional engagement. It's about providing um, our members with the right tools and messages, be that through social assets. We really um, will, yeah, want to get the stories out there, elevate best practice case studies around the um, soil, energy, biodiversity, we're looking for those that help to teach and educate others on where they may, or just think a little bit differently on where they may be able to improve. We're looking at, um, we are creating a new uh, impact report, um, which is basically the national data set. And from there, this is what we really wanna to take to the world and demonstrate what, what we're doing. 
uh, latest news section. This is, will be coming uh, from next month. So this is really around curating the stories of the sustainable wine growing community. Uh, for example, when regions talk about um, anything to do with the program, when we get a whole bunch of new certified members, members going through, when we see people that have got the trust mark um, going onto their bottle, an example of that would be Pusey Vale recently um, issued a press release and one of the first to put a mark, uh, use a trust mark on their bottle. These are exciting times. So all of this, we want to have that curated. So it's a, a really live space on the website. Uh, and then what else does the program offer? And I, I think that, that it's definitely um, marketing opportunities in there and, and, that's a, um, and that's a good thing. So for example, all the sustainable wine growing, uh, the video that you saw at the start, all the images on the website, any images that we're using in promotional materials are those certified members. So we are seeking those out first and um, they're, they're important stories to tell. Well, uh, working through social media, the PR, um, you know, will be more active in a PR and media landscape. In retail engagement, as I mentioned, we're working with or un working to understand the criteria and changes that all the retailers are making right now, making sure that our community will be aware of that so that people understand what's changing in the landscape around them. And then from a um, Australian Wine Made Our Way perspective, there's, there's more opportunities around um, how we take these stories around the globe. So whether that's through trade promotions at the moment, that would be um, events done through our Connect platform, or there may be opportunities that are happen happening in the Americas or UK markets. If there, and we are getting many requests for these, in terms of what's the sustainability or who's sustainable. The first place we go to is the membership database to understand who are the brands and prioritizing those that are certified to make sure that they're in the, um, the, the because that's true to their claim. It's, it's not enough now for everyone to just say I'm sustainable through their marketing story. If there is becoming the, you need to actually um, that be, be practicing sustainably and doing having run it, um, being a member of the program where we're making these assessments. Um, and then even retailer promos as well. So there are opportunities coming through from a global global um, landscape and and yeah, so these are all reasons to consider joining the program now. And if you haven't seen it, so sustainablewinegrowing.com.au is where to go or um, for any media or marketing inquiries, there's our info at sustainablewinegrowing.com.au. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Wonderful, Drea. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, there certainly is a lot happening and um, yeah, the program looks really Really beautiful. Uh, well done. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Marty Longbottom. So Marty began her career in the wine industry, helping to establish her family's vineyards in Padua, South Australia in the early 1990s. Uh, she holds undergraduate and postgraduate qualifications in viticulture from the University of Adelaide and has extensive technical and viticulture sorry, vineyard management experience in Australia and the US. For the past 10 years, Marty has focused on research and extension of wine industry sustainability projects, including regional climate risk analysis, benchmarking greenhouse gas emissions from vineyards and the management of co corporate water assets. She manages the Australian Wine Industry Sustainability Program, Sustainable Wine Growing Australia. I'll hand over to you, Marty. Thanks, Robin. And I just firstly want to thank the teams at Australian Grapes and Wine and also Wine Australia um, for bringing the commitment and the passion to this program for the last 12 months. It's been an absolute pleasure and I hope already you can see how much work we've really done in the last 12 months. So, um, and, and thanks to Anna also for painting that really clear picture of the growing demand for sustainability credentials and already we are, we are seeing that reflecting in our membership of the program. 
What you can see here reflects the results from the end of last year. But I think um, as importantly, I guess the, the, the most important thing is that our membership has increased and it increased in the last year by around about 30% in terms of membership numbers. And these numbers here that tell us that last year, the members were across 43 regions across Australia. Um, the vineyard area covered was around about a quarter of Australian, Australia's wine grape vineyards and around about the same for the national crush. And the proportion of those who are certified sits at around 15%. Um, and as I said, though, that, that growth is happening. And right now we're in the um, middle of the renewal period for the existing members, and we're seeing a massive growth in new members to the program. So we want to welcome you all and encourage you to keep going, get your data in, finish off your workbook. And we look forward to seeing you appearing on the um, member register. If you're curious to know who's in the membership, who's part of the membership, you can go online to that new website that Dre was talking about, sustainablewinegrowing.com.au. And up in the top right hand corner there where the red arrow is pointing, if you go onto that search member button, you can actually filter the most typical filters that I see people using. Are, you can search by member type, so that's a vineyard or a winery, search by who's in the state or region. You can use any of these filters and it will produce a list of who's in that category. But the example I've got here is just a very short list, it's not the entire list from the Hunter Valley, but it's just a couple from the top of the list. So if you're interested in finding out who's there, go to this page um, and you will see the difference between the members and the certified members, which is stated in there in that column, but also a lot of the certified members now just noting that these are live links. And if you click on those, those that will go to those certified members of websites. In terms of the program, we've been going through a massive evolution. I mean, the whole program has evolved over many, many years, um, but in the last 12 months, we've, we've or the last two years, we've seen significant changes. But for those of you who are not so familiar with the program and how it works, the members, we welcome them from both vineyards and wineries currently. And the vineyards and wineries currently report their data separately because their operations are separate. So all members go in and they go in now in July and August and they renew their membership and they go through the process of reporting their resource use um, data and also some data around their practices and then they go through the self-assessment workbook. And I've, I've tried to represent the topic areas that we go through. This is really just um, to give you some insight into the kinds of information, but Drea did lay it out pretty clearly before. It's about your production data. So for vineyards and wineries, it's the area of your vineyard or the tons you've crushed, the tons harvested, um, water use, energy use, um, soil management practices, biodiversity, waste, um, and others. And then when we go into the workbook, it covers all of those elements and then there's more. So there's a biosecurity section, there's a significant section on management and business activities, also air management and economics. So all of this, uh, sorry, that's so all members report that data annually. And then the bigger commitment comes from those certified members who do go through an independent audit process. Now they're audited against the Australian wine industry standards for sustainable practice. They're two private standards owned and managed by Fresh Care Limited. And we work collaboratively with Fresh Care to make sure we have the most robust information in those standards. Now this is just a, a snapshot with some insights into what the online membership database looks like. You can see across the top there are the pages and a member works through each of those pages one by one and all of the data is entered online. Now, one of the biggest pieces of work we've done in the last 12 months was really recognizing that we needed to continue to improve uh, both the data set and the workbook that we were collecting. And this is really to make sure they're in line with what the members are needing to record. And that's, I guess, in response to some of the stakeholder requests. But um, we wanted to, so that you can see the members of that technical working group who assisted in that process and I want to really strongly acknowledge all the um, hard work and time and effort they put into this process. But I guess as a group we collectively agreed that the aim of going through this process of uh, reviewing the data and workbook was we needed to maintain its simplicity. In the workbook specifically we wanted to ensure that there was a consistent scoring across each of the questions. We wanted to make sure that it was still best practice that everything we were asking for was practical, it was nationally relevant, and probably one of the most significant improvements we've made to the workbook this year is that each of the questions where it gets the best practice, it's aligned with the certification standards. So just to demonstrate what this looks like, 
And for those members, just to reassure you that the process of filling in the workbook is exactly the same as it has been for the last couple of years. Essentially, for each question, you put a tick in the box that aligns with the practice that you have in place in your vineyard or winery. And at level one, we've said, this is where you can demonstrate that you've got knowledge in the area. At level two, you've taken some action to implement best practice. And then when you get to um, number three, this is where we're considering best practice is at. And this is the bit that is aligned with the certification standards. So if you get to number three, if you're working through this and you're new to the program, you should uh, safely be able to say that you're getting ready to become certified and you just need to start that process. So if you get beyond three, and there are quite a number of people who've gone beyond that, really this just means that you've achieved best practice and you've done it consistently and you have um, plans or, or continuous improvement strategies well embedded in your practices. And this is just, I guess, a reminder for those of you who are familiar with the workbook, you've, you've seen this probably a lot, but just to remind you, each of the little question marks throughout the workbook, they've got tool tips in them. So if you hover over, over them or even click on them, it'll hold it open for you. There's some background information about the topic area that you're in. And then there's also links down the bottom that will also help you to improve your practices. And if you're finding that um, these are really useful, just remember that they're always there. You don't have to just log into the um, workbook once a year when you're renewing your membership, you can go in there at any time. We're doing a lot of work continuously um, updating these links and putting new resources in there. So I would encourage you to go back and regularly have a look at these. Once the workbook and the data are complete and plus the payment, you get to the results section. And I want to reinforce here, there's all of the data that gets entered into the system, both in the workbook and the data section it all gets collated and produced into a number of different reports. So for all members, it's definitely worth going back in there and having a look at your reports when they become available in October and have a look at the number of different ways you can see the data that you've put in there represented in the different reports. So just for those of you who are not familiar with the process, the data, so the renewal period finishes at the end of August. So we really encourage you all very, very strongly, put, it, put your data in before the end of August. We close it off and then what we do is that we do an audit of all of the data and look for any um, problem data that goes in and there's always a little bit of problem data. We'll go through and do some checking of all of that. And then in October, we'll release all of the reports. But what you'll be able to do initially is just have a, a look at the summary of your data, which is what you can see on the screen here. What you can see here, just to let you know that all of the data you're putting in there, it does go through and you can get a summary of your scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions. The example you can see here is from a winery. On the left, you can see the annual comparison of emissions, so broken down into electricity, waste, refrigerant, wine making CO2 and fuel use. So that's, that's where you can look at your, um, the difference in performance from year to year. And on the right there, you can see the emissions broken down proportionally. And again, reminder that all of the data that does go into the system, it, it is available for annual comparisons. So the longer you've put data in there, obviously the more data you can get exposure to, but you can look back historically and look at differences in your performance over time. And I think most of the feedback we've had on this is that it's a really valuable repository. For those who don't have great record keeping systems in place, this is a really good place to start doing that. The data is always there, it's always available. You just need to log in and open up those reports. And then we get to the benchmarking reports, and this is where um, all members have the opportunity to go in, select a number of different filters and produce all, a, a whole range of different reports. As Drea said before, it, you've got the ability to compare yourself to your neighbours in your region, you can compare yourself to others in the state or nationally, or even depending on the size of your enterprise, both vineyards and wineries, they're broken down into small, medium and large. So you can just select a group in the same size category as you and compare your performance. So what, what we hear from the members though, is that these are the reports that provide them with the most meaningful insights into their businesses. And this kind of benchmarking is not available anywhere else that, that we're aware of for the wine industry. But what these reports really do clearly show is that it, by looking at the dials and looking at, if you've got any of those dials in the red section, these are opportunities for you to improve your practices, find efficiencies in your system. And on the other hand, if you're in the green section, this is where you can really get that reinforcement of the 
positive practices that you've got in place. So moving to certification, there's growing interest and demand for certification. And I think both Anna and Drea have kind of highlighted why well, some of the drivers for this. Um, but what I wanted to, I guess, show you was some of the insights that we've had from a lot of different members in the last, I guess these insights here, we've been collecting these for the last few years. Um, and we know that really it's some of the leaders out there who are emerging as the early adopters of certification. More recently though, when we're talking to the producers and specifically when we're talking to producers who, who have already engaged in those first steps of certification, is that the most, one of the most common responses we get when we ask them why they're pursuing certification is that people say, we know we're doing a good job. And I'd agree most great growers and winemakers are doing a really good job, but they're now seeing that the time is that they're gonna, they're gonna stop um, talking the talk and start walking the talk. So really being able to demonstrate with a lot of confidence that what they're doing is really actually what they're doing. More than ever, growers and winemakers are saying, my customers are asking for it. They're requiring certification. But I think the most meaningful one, and this really in the last six months has come out really strongly, is that people are pursuing certification because it gives them that confidence to communicate their credentials. And then speaking to the people after they've been through the certification process, what they tell us is that the program enables them to pull everything together into a single system under a single umbrella and it enables them to get their records into shape and especially to provide their evidence that they're doing what they're saying that they're doing. So the certified members of the program, what they get is a, um, a different certificate to the ordinary members. So they'll, they'll have a trust mark on that certificate and that what we're noticing is the certified members are using the trust mark on property signs. So there are more and more property signs going out and you can see them on vineyard gates. We're seeing them embedded into people's email footers. We're seeing them on different websites, including marketing materials. And really excitingly, we're starting to see them on wine labels. Uh, Drea mentioned these before, the case studies. From a technical case study perspective, we will definitely preferentially go to the certified members because we know that they've got an extra layer of rigor in both their data and also their practices. So we've got a, a number of case studies in the pipeline. Um, so I'll show you later, but you go on the website to have a look at those case studies. So the certified members have gone through a third party audit. So that is the standards that I referred to before, the Fresh Care Australian Wine Industry Standards of Sustainable Practice. They've been through an audit in the past three years. And the process for getting to that point of certification is that it's important that you attend one of the, um, it's a one-off training session before you're certified. And really the purpose of that one-off training is to make sure you're super familiar with the standards. You know exactly what's required of you to be able to demonstrate and an audit, and you get all the tools and the resources and the assistance to get you to the, to get you ready for the audit process. And that audits happen once every three years. So there's an initial audit, as soon as you're ready, you feel like you've got everything in place, and then your next audit is in three years time. So these are the certificates that I was referring to before. This is the fresh care certificate that's issued by the certification body. And it's really important that once you do get one of these certificates, you let us know by updating all the details from that certificate into our database. As soon as we receive that, and we can verify that you've got a certificate, you can then be um, recognised as a certified member of Sustainable Wine Growing Australia. So if you've got any questions about the certification process, it's all laid out really clearly on the website. So go to the website and get that information. Um, so this, the Sustainable Wine Growing Australia Trust Month has just celebrated its first birthday. As Anna mentioned, this was a significant co-investment by the AWRI and Australian Grape and Wine. And this was in recognition of how important it was to the program and how important it was to the members. Um, the trust mark has been going through uh, the national trademarking process, so that's complete here in Australia, and it's still in the pro process of becoming internationally certified, sorry, trademarked. It has gone through that successfully in some countries, we're just waiting for the last couple of countries to come through. But I think the most important thing about the trust mark is that this is really the tool that gives the certified members that ability to, to communicate with confidence their credentials. And as I mentioned, 
the trust mark itself is growing in its visibility. Here's just a couple of the certified members that you may have seen through the presentation, but you can see the certified members, there is an element of pride here, and it is great going into a region where you see lots of these um, signs going up on the vineyard gate. So we do really encourage, if you're a certified member, start using the trust mark. We would love for you to use the trust mark. The more it gets out there, the more visible it is, and the more meaningful it becomes. So just tell us how you're going to use it and put it out there. Now, if you start seeing the trust mark on wine labels, again, this is a really exciting part of um, the evolution of the trust mark in the last 12 months. You will know that the wine in the bottle has come from certified bits of soap. The grapes came from the certified vineyards and the wine was made in a certified winery. So if you're a certified member and you're considering using the trust mark on wine labels, just be really um, conscious about the timing of getting your certification. So you need to know that certification for a vineyard needs to be in place before the start of the growing season. That's so that the whole of the growing season, all of those processes and practices are in place, your certification's in place before the growing season. And for a winery, the certification needs to be in place before you start receiving fruit at vintage time. If you need any more guidance on how you should be using the trust mark, all of that information is available online or for the certified members, you can access it through the member database. Now the cost for the program, so the ongoing annual cost for membership with Sustainable Wine Growing Australia is $110 per year. So that's for each site that's got a membership. And then for certification, there's the cost for that one-off training. So this is once um, you pay. Now there's different providers for the training. AWRI is one of the providers, but there are other independent providers out there who can do this. The range is between about $400 and $1,000 for the training. And then the audit cost again. So there's six different certification bodies who can do the audits. It, it's a, a free marketplace, but we're told and the guidance that we've been given is that those audits cost between about $1,000 and $2,000. And remembering that that's a triennial audit. So it's once every three years. Now, I've just gone at a pretty fast pace and at a pretty high level on all of the um, components of the program, but we've, there's a lot of frequently asked questions or the answers to those questions online, and I'd strongly encourage you to go there and have a look through there. And if, we, if you can't find the answer to your question there, I'll be very surprised, but if you can't, make sure you contact us at the help desk. Um, in terms of the year ahead for us, from a technical perspective, there's a couple of things that we're working on, which are really exciting. We've got new membership types. Now the first one is for wine businesses because currently membership is for vineyards and wineries, not um, wine brands or wine labels. So this new wine business category will be for people who fall into that category, those who don't have a physical winery um, asset. So that's well underway and we're hoping that we'll be able to release that later this month. Uh, and that, um, so by signing up for membership in the wine business type, that will mean that you'll also, once you become certified, you'll also be able to use the trust mark on wine labels. The other two membership um, types that are on the horizon for us is around packaging. We're getting lots of inquiries about how packaging facilities can also become certified and be part of the certification process. Um, and the last one there is regional memberships. We know how important regions are to the success of the program. And we're hearing it loud and clear that the regions are wanting a regional membership so that they can access their own regional data and use the assets at the regional level. So we're working really hard on being able to deliver that one as well. Um, we're also doing a, a review of the standards. So we've got those two standards. They've been in place for over a year now, but it's time for us to go back over those and incorporate the feedback that we've been receiving from industry into those standards. Um, and we've got an ongoing um, plan for improvement within the database and also the reporting. So you, you, over time, you'll see some changes happening in the database. And we've also got an ongoing plan for developing new member case studies. So if you're a certified member, and if you've got a good story to tell, especially one that's backed by data that you've collected through the program, or back using your benchmarking reports, I'd love to hear from you because we want to tell your story. Right. The other thing is that certification training, there's a huge demand for certification training at the moment. Um, if you're interested in that, make sure if you go online and go to the certification process page, there's an expression of interest form there fill out that form and as soon as we have new courses available, you can sign up for those courses. But 
um, we find the best way to do these is face to face. Obviously, we've got, had massive restrictions in the last year about getting out to the regions and doing those. So we are able to do them virtually. So we do online training courses, but we're also looking for alternative methods of doing this. And one of those is another um, way of um, providing the online training, but more at a self-paced um, level for different people who that option might be more suitable for. Now, I flipped this slide in right at the end because this is one of the most common questions we get asked at the help desk. Um, and the question is really, what's the difference between organic certification and sustainability certification? And I've tried to represent this really simply and it is not at all comprehensive and it's not supposed to be that way. I just thought it was a nice way to kind of visually look at the, the kind of the two different systems together. What you can see here is that in the middle there where the two, where organic and sustainable um, crossover, what I've tried to represent here is land and soil management, water management, biodiversity, and also pest and disease management. These are the elements that the two different systems have in common. Over on the right though, you can see sustainability takes that more holistic approach and it incorporates a lot more of the business elements um, and continuous improvement in business, but also critically, and this is where it um, speaks to the climate change issues that Anna really outlined pretty clearly, we also capture that data um, that does have an influence on climate change, where the greenhouse gas emissions associated with electricity and fuels, we look at air quality, economic performance, and also biosecurity, bio waste, and community. Now, the one that stands out over on the organic one is GM production. And I just wanted to call this out. Um, this is specifically called out in organics. We don't call it out specifically in sustainable wine growing Australia. That is because the Australian wine industry has a position on GM, um, GMOs, and that is that we don't support the use of um, GM, uh, GMOs in wine production in Australia. So this is inherent in sustainable wine growing Australia. So that brings me to the end. I just want to, um, if you want to contact me directly, you can. If you've got technical um, issues or questions about the program, though, I would strongly encourage you to go to the AWR help desk. And just to let you know, the people who are on the help desk who are most likely to answer your call could be me, it could be my colleague Liz Pitcher or Danielle Carter. And just new to the team who's not up there on the screen is also Krista, Krista Schwartz. So you may get one of us um, on the other end of the phone. Um, we've been getting a lot of calls in the last few weeks related to the membership renewals, but be patient with us. If you can't get us on the phone, please send us an email. Um, lastly, I just want to acknowledge there's a lot of people, you know, this program has been in, in, it's been evolving for many, many years and the knowledge and all of the input that goes into this is drawing on a huge long history of work that other people have done. So if you're interested in knowing more about what came before us, there's all of that is laid out on the website. I'd encourage you to go and have a look at our history. I wanna acknowledge the members. Without the members and the feedback that they give us, it is really rich, it's really valuable. We're always listening to your feedback. So thank you to the members for your ongoing support. The Australian Grape and Wine, it's Anna, Hooper and Tony Battling that have been leading the charge. I'm gonna call them out specifically. And at Wine Australia, Alex Sass, Drea Hall, Stu Barclay, Andreas before he left, and now Stephen Weiner. And of course, the Sustainability Advisory Committee. So this is the industry group that um, advises us on the elements that we need to keep including and improving on in the program. And then the regions, without you in the regions, we also wouldn't be able to do everything that we do. The way that you're um, pushing information out through your newsletters, social media, the workshops that you've invited us to attend, the presentations that you're giving, the letters of support you've written for us, but we really, really appreciate you and we can't wait to engage with you more closely in the next year. And lastly, the team at AWRI, the team I just showed you before, but the broader team here, including Mark Christie as well, who's been giving a lot of support and time to this program in the last 12 months. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marty. Great presentation. And uh, now is our Q&A session. So I'd like to invite all of the panelists to rejoin. And um, we've got a few questions to um, go through. And um, so the first question um, for Drea, the um, Sustainable Wine Growing Australia um, promo video at the start. Uh, is there a link uh, that is available uh, for the uh, webinar participants to, to go to? Uh, 
Uh, sure. Um, I will send you the link. It's actually sitting on the website in the About Us section. So I can Great. probably post that here in the chat, maybe. Let me Great. have a go. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Thank you. And we will also send out that uh, link when we send the webinar recording as well. Um, so thank you. Uh, so Steve has recently purchased a vineyard. He doesn't have any of the previous year's data, therefore cannot fill in the workbook, but can he still sign up to Sustainable Wine Growing Australia for, for these vineyards or do they need a year's worth of data, Marty? Yeah, hi Steve. I would strongly recommend that you do still sign up. We do have a number of members in this kind of um, case where you've just acquired a vineyard. Maybe you don't have the historical data. What we do is we make a note of it on our side of it. You won't get informative benchmarking reports, but it means that you're in the system and you're familiar with it. And then you know which kind of data you'll need to collect for the next year. So in short, the answer is yes, you should sign up now. Great. Um, and a question for you, Anna. Um, sustainable finance partnerships, um, how are they working for wine growers at the moment? Um, well, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia had, when they announced that uh, sustainability linked line, so it's the first, what, first of its kind for agriculture. So uh, it's early days, but it's a new initiative, but it's certainly one that's gaining momentum. And I'd really encourage people to talk to their investors and also their banks and share the fact that we've um, that we've got sustainable wine growing Australia and whether or not they're you know willing to consider advantages for people that are on that trajectory. Um, so yeah, I think the opportunities really are for us, and this is already in train, is to look at whether or not we can align the program so it actually is meeting the needs of banks and investors and generating that value for, for members and certified members. Great, thank you, Anna. Uh, Marty, how do people find out about the training workshops? There's a couple of different ways. Um, if you want to have training with the AWRI, you can go onto the Sustainable Wine Growing Australia website and in the certification section, there's an expression of interest form. Fill in the expression of interest form and that will put you on the list of people waiting to attend one of these workshops. And then every time we release a new workshop, you'll get sent a link so that you can register to it. So that's how you do it. Or alternatively, if you want to get one of the other training providers, go to the Fresh Care website and look under training. And so the virtual training option that you were talking about isn't available at the moment, but when it will be, when it is available, it will be put on the website, the details in the same yeah. location. Just, yeah. just to clarify, there's two that, so we currently do virtual training, so that's face-to-face -face and real time. Mm -hmm. But what we're looking at is, is an alternative self-paced virtual training. So that one's right. not available yet. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so Hugh Armstrong, are there options for carbon farming on the vineyard or from the winery? Marty, would you like to answer that one? I think Anna was getting ready to answer. Oh, that. Anna, great. Well, I was, was going to start and I might hand to you in case you've got more to say, but at the moment, um, my understanding is compliance measuring and reporting costs are tending to outweigh any of the benefits in terms of the opportunity for in gaining income. However, I think as we as technology improves, we're um, we're getting more and more ability to be able to more cost effectively measure and model um, performance. So who knows what's um, on the horizon? And I think just on that, the more people we get reporting now, so we can start to get a better understanding of what practices people are doing that might be generating carbon in their soil. The more likely it is that we can do the research we need to be able to perhaps open up those opportunities in the future. Okay, thank you. Marty, do you have anything to add there? No, I think Anna did a good job there. I think, I guess the only other thing to say is that there's looking beyond carbon farming for a financial return, obviously there's lots of benefits in improving carbon levels in soil. So we do strongly encourage people to do that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, someone puts in, put, put up a comment. I think some case studies would be very useful showing what the tangible benefits are for growers. So you've started putting case studies together already, uh, looking at the benefits. So um, jump onto the website and have a look 
um, for the case studies that are already there and and watch this space because it's continually um, being more content is being developed. And so we've got feedback from the market is mainly a desire for organic and biodynamic. There has been less demand for sustainable. What are the plans for educating the markets, especially the US? Thank you, Peter. Uh, is this a, a Drea question? Yeah, thanks, Peter, for those comments. I think that has been the case, but back to the point earlier around this acceleration and change in consumer, um, I guess a consumer behaviour is environment is now trumping organics. And, and that um, has best been, I've seen a report from Wine Intelligence this year, their sustainable organic lower alcohol low alcohol wines report, which was released earlier this year, actually showed for the first time that um, sustainable practices became first in consideration. I hope I'm ex articulating this ex correct, but it's actually first in um, consideration over organics for the first time. So there is, is absolutely a shift. Um, but how we tell the story and make the differenti differentiation between organic and sustainable, yes, there still needs to be more work done there, but we are, we have that front of mind. So Drea, you spoke earlier about the free to access training um, material that people can access from all over the world. So I imagine there would be some material that you would develop for, for that. Um, it is, yes, yeah. it's definitely on our list to, to um, or even, you know, we're looking at different ways, whether it's through infographics, but to better um, articulate the story. Yes. Okay, great. Be All right, thank you. So what are the challenges or gaps found when considering winery or vineyards as sustainable under the certifications available on the market? Anna, another question for you. Well, I think we're really fortunate and I'm really pleased to say that we're leading the way with sustainable wine growing Australia in terms of other sectors. We've been doing this for a long time and um, the reporting functions of sustainable wine growing Australia in terms of environmental performance are also leaders. Um, you know, we're pretty progressive in terms of wine globally in terms of what we report. So if you look at the Australian Ag Sustainability Framework that I referred to, we're actually pretty well aligned. So there's not a lot of gaps in that respect. The one exception to that is biodiversity. And that's a gap that's common. Um, that hasn't been filled by anyone at this stage. Hence this program that we've got um, funding through the federal government that the National Farmers Federation are managing to look at how um, we might be able to better value nat natural capital. So really the only gap that we've got is the number of producers who are certified who are reporting and certified in order that we can we can um, seize those opportunities thanks Anna Drea or Marty do you have anything to add to that um, to Anna's answer no great thank you so we've got uh, a question that's popped up in the um, chat section. So um, Trevor has a small business uh, wine vine in WA. There's your free free plug, Trevor. Um, and he's interested in whether um, he can get involved uh, with or leverage the sustainability um, program. Um, and so they promote vineyards and wines of Western Australia. So um, you spoke, Marty, about the um, vineyard, the winery memberships. You talked about some new um, categories with brands, packaging and regions. Is there um, de development in the future for these types of um, businesses that want to be connected with um, Sustainable Wine Growing Australia? Mm. I think longer term, there will be an opportunity for businesses like Trevor's to potentially participate in that way. Um, it's not super clear and we're just trying to understand what the demand look for that looks like at the moment. But perhaps, Jay, did you want to mention in terms of being supporters of the program? Uh, yeah, there, there's definitely, um, I guess we're 
there's a space on on the website or throughout messaging where we're um, those those entities, associations, um, or businesses that that support the program. It, um, we we have a space to to show that. Um, and yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Drea has also uh, shared the link to the um, to the video in the chat section if you want to jump on there. Uh, and then also uh, Marty or one of her team has also sent a link to the certification training section on the Sustainable Wine Growing website. Um, one, we've got a few more questions. So how long does it start uh, how long does it take from the start to the finish um, for a wine, uh, a vineyard to become certified? Sure. That's a, it's a tricky question. Um, for vineyards and wineries that have fairly sophisticated systems in place already, to go to the point of nothing to being certified, in theory, you can do it really quickly. From the time you've had your training, I, I know of businesses who've become certified within a month of that. And that's mainly because they're drawing on all the resources and systems that they've already got in place. Um, but even for the average grower or winery, so smaller or medium size, we've also seen plenty of those get from zero to 100 in a pretty short period of time. I've known them to get everything in place within a month as well. Part of doing the training is that we go through line by line virtually in the standard what you need to do. And we also give the resources and tools to help you meet the requirements of the standard. So in terms of the paperwork and the systems that you put in place, we do a lot of that in the training session. So you'll get a lot of that done. It's just then if you've got big gaps on your vineyard or in your winery where you do need to make improvements, and most people it's just making sure their chemical shed is pretty well cleaned up and doing a few other, you know, what I'd consider fairly basic modifications. Um, it's relatively simple. It really depends. I, it's really more around how driven you are to get it done. It can be done really quickly. Others, depending on also how deeply they want to entrench this into their business. I've also known others who might spend six months putting their systems in place in preparation for certification. Mm. Great, thank you, Marty. Uh, so a question about the costs associated with the audit and um, training. So is that um, tax deductible? That's not the kind of advice I can give, unfortunately. I'd have to say, better talk to your accountant. Okay, thank you. Great. Wonderful. Uh, so we've managed to answer all of the questions. Uh, thank you very much um, to Anna, Drea and Marty for your presentations today. It was um, yeah, a really great session. So thank you. I'm sure everyone got a lot out of it and I'm sure you'll be inundated with uh, lots of um, questions, Marty. So lucky you've got another <laughs> team member <laughs> that's just started. Um, I'd also like to um, thank uh, our audience who has who has joined us and, re and remind you that uh, a recording of the webinar will be emailed out to you um, shortly. Our events team are incredibly efficient, so it won't take long. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for this webinar program via the AWRI Extension Project. And our next webinar so um something that you said anna about the eu uh bringing on their farm to fork uh program with the harmonized risk indicator and the fact that um, they're expecting a 50 percent reduction in uh, pesticide use and that may start to affect um growers in, in Australia. So that's a really good introduction to our next uh, webinar, which is on the 2nd of September, and it's uh, looking at non-chemical weed control options. So we've got uh, the wonderful Chris Penfold joining us and Dr. Thomas Lyons as well from uh, the University of Adelaide. So yeah, jump on to the website and register if you're interested in that. Um, and thank you. Thank you all again for um, your great presentations and for the audience.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Robin. <laughs>